Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drumming hitmaker Stephen Wolf. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, Rock and Rollers? Rich Redman here. Yep, it's that time. It's another episode of The Rich Redman Show, brought to you by the School of Rock. And on this show, we talk about things like music, motivation, success. I'm talking to comedians, thought leaders, authors, actors, and drummers. Lots of drummers. Jim, my co-host, joining me in Spring Hill, Tennessee, also a drummer, professional voiceover artist, JM. What's the, what, What's your website, buddy? Uh, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com. That's right. You want to look that up. But today's guest, I know we're both going to geek out. We're both, <laughs> we're both going to be so excited about this because he's such a, an accomplished individual, Grammy award winning drummer, programmer, writer, producer, and remixer, Wolf. How are yeah. you, buddy? Uh, I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's great. Stephen Wolf, man. I said, hey, well, how, what do you like to go by? And he's like, well, man, since I was a young man, my friends. They call me Wolf, man. That's easy to remember. Yeah. My, my first, like, legit touring gig, the bass player was also a Steven. So um, people have been calling me Wolf or Wolfman before that, but it was Hiram Bullock, actually. For, for younger people who don't know the original Letterman band guitarist. Yeah. He got a major label deal, quit Letterman, and um, he, uh, he was like, you're Wolf from now on, and it just stuck. So, <laughs> so you're joining us from, from Ashy. Los Angeles, I guess you, you really, you're, uh, how long have you been in New York? That really is how, your home. Yeah. I, I started working in New York while I was still, before I dropped out of Berkeley, I was joining Hiram's band. I, Charlie Drayton had just left the band. I was with huge shoes to fill, by the way, going <laughs> back and forth. And, um, finally Hiram at a certain point was like, I'm not getting you hotels anymore. If you want to stay on the gig, you got to move here. So I, I moved there. My lease, my first lease started January 1st, 1990 in New York. And I've been based there ever since, but I've, I've been doing the bi-coastal yeah. thing for a while. And I was still mostly in New York and just shorter trips to LA. And then when things got serious with my girlfriend, it, it became more, more and more equal. And since the pandemic started, I'm just out here. So. Yeah. You told me April 2nd, boom, you're on a plane. March 13th, I was on a plane out there and I'm with my gal in West Hollywood. Where are you guys? Um, we're in Culver City. I, I usually stay before her. I was I, a friend, producer friend has a like a guest house in West Hollywood where I usually am based out here. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, in normal yeah. times, we would we would be running into each other. Yeah. But Absolutely. I just, I just like to, you know, break the ice. I mean, I, we spent a little time together. I was wishing it was much more, but a year, several yeah. years ago, I think it maybe at five or six years ago, I was hanging yeah. out with uh, Marco Sicoli, hey, Grappa sure. man, and we yeah. came to see you play at the bitter end with Oz Noy, and you were just crushing yep. it, man. Great night. Thank you so much. Yeah, I remember. I remember you were wearing a very cool leather shirt, or I don't know if it was a jacket, like a thin jacket or a leather it was, shirt. It was a shacket. Shacket, yeah. I, I remember that, and uh, yeah, it was really good to meet you in person. We've talked, we talked online before then, and I, I've tried to explain to to non musicians how drummers, we, we're much more communal than I, than I think other people who play other instruments. Absolutely, yeah, we have this unspoken fraternity yeah. and brotherhood where we're naturally attracted to each other and we celebrate each other's victories. And a lot For of sure. times we will um, emphasize someone's strengths rather than focusing on their weaknesses, you know, cause we're all kind of like snowflakes and, yeah. and I just like to watch the drummers, man. And I always pick up and steal something from someone, J uh, Jim, longtime drummer. And he got into voiceover. Neil Peart was his guy. And, um, yeah, that's Stuart yeah. was my guy. I mean, everybody was our guy, but I mean, I love sure. Stuart. Yeah. Wow. That's funny. I mean, I can hear it. And, and somebody said that to me when, my first year in New York, like a lot of people, I did a lot of wedding and bar mitzvah, just the whole, they call them club dates in New York. I think they call them something different in every city. But uh, the, um, one of the keyboard players in the band after a gig was like, man, I, I can tell like Stuart Copeland is one of your biggest influences. And I was like, no. And I didn't realize, and I learned the term recently on, on the internet, uh, he was a huge passive influence because I was nerding out like, putting my finger on the turntable to slow down like Billy Cobham and Tony Williams, like the, like the more esoteric drumming to, to transcribe that shit. 
And that, that stuff I really had to pay attention to to play, whereas the stuff I heard on the radio every day, including Stor Copeland, who was all over the radio back then, sure. I, I didn't necessarily have to transcribe it, but I just picked, I, he, he influenced how I play songs in a huge way. And I didn't, it wasn't until that guy said it, I was like, wow, passively, he was actually a massive influence on me. And I, and I know he was a country drummer, but I know from having watched enough videos of you, you're not just a country drummer. <laughs> with being just a country over but um yeah i store copeland had such a unique musicality um that i don't think we're probably in the similar age group i don't think you can not be influenced by him yes. but I, I guess that he was your main guy especially judging by your, your kit you know and the cross stick well i mean i tell people all the time and i played along with police records which trains yeah. you to really get a really solid cross stick together which you're definitely going to yeah. have to use and you know yeah. uh playing country music but jim yeah. check this out if you go to wolfadelic.com it's w-o-l-f-e delic.com now look at this list of folks and i just got i just got surgery on my left eye and this is a little bit challenging maybe i'll put the readers on Okay, uh, Alicia Keys, Beyonce, Katy Perry, David Bowie, Miley Cyrus, Kelly Clarkson, Pink, Britney Spears, Aretha Franklin, Cher, Celine Dion, Annie Lennox, The Bee Gees, Natalie Imbruglia, Kesha, Shaka Khan, Josh Stone, the list goes on and on. And that's you either playing acoustic drums and percussion and or programming. Yeah, and I should I should say... I'm such a huge Bowie fan. The Bowie credit was a posthumous gig. It was right after he died. I still had to be vetted because it was only Bowie people doing it. It was something that, that he had, want, had started before he passed. And my friend Mario McNulty, great engineer, great producer, had started with David. And then afterwards, it was all David's people. So Sterling Campbell, amazing new drummer, was going to play the drums at Mario. was like, we really need some programming. And David was really into it. He listed the programmers he liked. And he said, you're the guy for that. I just have to get approval from the Bowie people to bring you in. So so it was really cool to work on. But I I, I don't want to be one of those guys. It's like, yeah, man, I was I was in the studio with Bowie. He was, you know, his posture. Yeah. Oh, man, it's, it, I, I still feel like if you're working on a project like that, that the credit is completely value, validated. No, I, I, you know, I, I own the credit, but like, there's a drummer. I don't want to say who is his he is, his name. I'm sure you know him, but he would lie about his credits. Like, <laughs> not like not just like he did it possibly. He would just make up shit that saying he worked with people that he didn't. And Bowie was one of the main god names he would drop all the wow. time. Wow. So I try to be the opposite of that. Yeah. Yeah. The legitimacy, because anything can be found out on the internet. Yes. <laughs> I know we so have no privacy, but yeah. so you went to Berkeley and around the yeah. time you got the Hiram Bullock gig, you were kind of really into, I think we were all around that age category, really into the fusion thing. I know that I was chasing the electric band return to forever Mahavishnu yeah. orchestra. And I wanted yeah. to, you know, uh, I was in school at North Texas with uh, Carlock and we were, he was really into chambers and Weckle and we were transcribing yeah. that stuff. Is that yeah. right? Kind of. Yeah, yeah totally. Same, same, yeah, same guys, um, Omar, Keen, Gad, obviously. But yeah, I think Weckl and Dennis were like the two probably at, at that time they were peaking more than, but but yeah, before that it was Gad, Cobb, and Tony Williams. I mean, all, and before that, all the jazz greats, like the, the old school, you know, straight ahead players and then post pop and then fusion. But yeah, I was a big fusion head and Hiram really worked that out of me because i um, I was trying to play all that shit because he had worked with Dennis and, you know, he, he worked with all my heroes and, and he worked with Jordan for years. Um, and, but I had heard there were bootlegs with him playing with Jocko and Ken with Denard where Woody is just blazing. And then I heard, I heard him play with Dennis and Dennis is blazing. And so I thought that's what he wanted to hear. And like when some of the earliest rehearsals, he, he would just shut me down. And they'd be like, that is really horrible. He, not like, it's bad drumming. He was like, but nobody wants to hear that shit. He said, and I was like, yeah, but Dennis. And he was like, if I wanted Dennis to be my, my drummer, he'd be my drummer. And he said, my fa my, the main drummers that have been my drummers are, are Charlie Great and Steve Jordan. And if they're not available, Steve Ferroni. He said, those are the three guys. Study them if you want to work in New York. Play more like them, less bullshit. Just pocket and, 
and taste what if any kind of any kind of steve i'll take any kind of steve man but (laughs) but but he you know he hired you because he must have heard some spark of some because you're a young man at the time you were probably 19 20 years old right so we're the same age i was born in july of 1970 like so Uh, i was i'm 52 now i was born in 60 yeah like two years older than you about the same age so yeah i was 20 and you look fantastic yeah man thank you it's uh it was for a while you were a vegan you you were really a vegan i was gonna say a big thing that has helped me age well is that when i was 20 i cut out red meat dairy and sugar and and then eventually all animal products for a while but on the road back in the 90s trying to be vegan was just rough and um (laughs) yeah so i so I eat a little bit of chicken and eggs these days, but I'm still mostly vegan. And, and no, like the sugar thing, I think has been a huge factor in me aging well. Wow! So, if you had to guess my age, what would you guess it? <laughs> um, <Jim. laughs> let me see again. Jim, I, Jim, I'll, I'll, thing, uh, I, I never know be, because it's like I have friends. Like, do you know Paul Pesco, the guitar player? Let, mm. He's one of those names you don't know, but his resume is ridiculous and um he he hooked me up with my first major pop gig and um he he's in his 60s now and i look at the guy and i'm like how are you like he looks maybe 40s so i i try not to guess people's age because it's so yeah i don't know but uh jim how how old are you i'm i'm only 23 so (laughs) (laughs) jim is 45 years old he just had a birthday he's younger than me he's younger than me but i mean the sugar thing is that's a hard one man because because rich got to have his m&ms every once in a while you know like this this is like the junk foodiest i get and this is a smoothie with unsweetened almond milk frozen bananas raw cacao powder and Usually almond butter, but I was out of almond butter today, so it's peanut butter. But just nothing but peanuts. So. That's all power food, man. Good That's for all. You. Yeah, those are very, very high antioxidant. Yeah. I love. I like smoothies, man. I've taken a little break from those. I got to start bulleting up again. Yeah. If you, if you, Vitamix. It's it's it. If you had told me that I would spend five hundred dollars on a blender years ago, I would have laughed. But yeah, great investment. That what is very. Use? Yeah. Very West Hollywood uh, a smoothie right there, buddy. The most I've ever paid for a smoothie was on the corner of Sunset and Kawanga, this little <laughs> whole food shop, $17 for a oh smoothie. Oh, my gosh. Probably, probably like this. Big. That was that big, but I was really yeah. hungry. I needed something, man. Yeah, Wolf, they- I got to say, I'm watching your videos on your website, and mm-hmm. although I can't hear what you're playing, you have a very uncanny um, similarity to Zorro's playing style, believe it or not. I could believe that. Is is it because because people not the hat. Just, reasons I wear shades? No, no. Is, no I, th- I think it's because he's got you've got very muscular hands and he's got that French grip thing going, and you've okay. got a similar okay. thing. Interesting. Well, I, I love Zorro, so I'll yeah. take that. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, man. Yeah. So, so. Uh, we were talking about so what we were talking about, Hiram, he saw a spark yeah. in your playing and he gave you great advice, like oh, play no, the song, keep the time. Well, I could do that. And I did that because when in high school, I was in two bands in Philly, a lot of talent in Philly. So yeah. I was playing fusion band and most of the cats I played with went on to all have successful careers, either um, as artists, sidemen or music executives. And um or some, sometimes they made the progression. One guy, a friend, he got signed early. Now he's a big executive. But um, the fusion bands, like I had my double kick kit playing all the cob and shit. And then I was also playing in like a co- like cover, but some original band that was like what was on the radio at the time. So we were doing Prince, The Police, like Brian Adams, whatever, anything that was big, we did shit like that. And so that I was playing a much smaller kit kick snare hat mostly and then i bought the first self-contained simmons pad it was an sds1 wow and it, and it had like it was like a regular simmons pad and it, at the end it had this little cover you would remove and it had like a uh, i think it was like an eprom chip and you could it would play one sound and it had the controls and the sound i got was the the prince made it famous but it was a lindrum detuned side stick that <laughs> sound yeah. it, it, like when doves cry let's go crazy a bunch of other songs and I just, I was like, I need that sound on my kit. And I also was very into electronics pretty early because I, I, like hip hop was starting when I was a kid. So like 
Sucker MCs by Run DMC the first time I heard that on the radio, I knew it was a drum machine and I knew that it's just a completely different aesthetic. So I saved up and got my first drum machine. Okay, what was the drum machine? It was, I couldn't afford a Lindrum, not even close. It was a Yamaha RX series machine. It was That there. was my first drum machine, the RX-8. <laughs> Oh, they, they made a few numbers. There was like the 8, 15, like 11 or something. It had the individual so, sliders and it had the RAM yeah, card. Yeah. yeah. And the buttons went clickety-clack. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, but that's how I learned to program. That's very cool that you had that too. So, but I'm, I'm bringing that up to say like when I played that stuff, I played for the song. I kept it simple. But I thought that because Hiram was like a very accomplished fusion guy too, that he expected me to play that way. And he was like, no, play. he was like, I'm, he was like, I'm a singer songwriter. I mean, he didn't, he didn't say it that way, but that's essentially what he was telling me. So yeah. it was great advice. And, yeah, um, great advice, man. So you're obviously so studied. Jim took some lessons in his youth. Um, I just can't imagine what it would have been like growing up in the seventies. If we had this thing called the school of rock and they're the sponsor really? of our show, there's 250 locations right here in Nashville. They've got two locations in Nashville and Franklin, our friends, Kelly and Angie McCray, aren't they a great couple, Jim? They are. They, they're good running a fantastic program. Good-looking couple, married a long time, great business people. I've been very involved with them over the last decade, but they're sponsoring our show, and they're doing a great thing because the kids can go in and learn to play a musical instrument. And let's face it, this is a, if they never go on to become professional musicians, they're going to learn about showing up on time, being prepared, being able to take direction, working as part of a community, and they learn how to perform because the School Rock kids are always going out and doing live performances and taking music to the people. So if you're a parent, you want to round out that kid, that education for your kids. You know you got them in soccer practice, in baseball practice, and they're going to ballet. You're getting them piano lessons. You sign them up at the School of Rock. Jim, how do they do that? Franklin at schoolofrock.com or Nashville at schoolofrock.com and possibly soon to be Mount Juliet at schoolofrock.com, I would imagine. Not confirmed, though. We love the School of Rock. It's learn by doing, man. That is awesome. So, yeah, man. So, my, my thing with, uh, you know, with programming is I never kept up with it to the extent that you did where I got, actually got, you know, gold records on my walls from my programming. Um, but it was always a part of my life where I always had the Yamaha machines and then the roll-in things. And then I bought my first drum cat by playing You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown in the theater. And I saved up my pay and I bought my drum cat. And then when I started doing session work in, in Nashville, it was like we started using the little boss machines. And then a couple of the guys had an MPC floating around. And I would use those uh, stylus spectrosonics loops because you could just pull them up and drop them and play on top of them yeah. and um so so but you took it to, to high art what is your box is it the akai thing i um i actually uh, i don't know how many years ago i got rid of all of my hardware and, and i i own multiple npcs so my favorite machine to work on was an npc 3000 it was the last and it was the last MPC that had Roger Lynn's name on it because the first MPC was, was a, a collaboration with Roger Lynn and Akai. Yeah. Um, and so it was a pretty antiquated machine. And the last record I used it on was, um, speaking of not getting credit, I, they, they didn't put my name on the first release. And they emailed me saying, hey, uh, this is so-and-so from the a &R department. At, I think she's RCA. Like, it, it came to my attention. We may have forgotten to, use your, uh, to list you as a credit on the record. We're really sorry. We'll try to get it on the next one and just let us know how you want your name spelled. And I was like, so you, that sounds like you don't, if you didn't may have, like you definitely left it off. So, um, it's like, here's a $50 gift card to Bennigan's. Yeah. And, 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 and that was that, that record ended up uh, winning a Grammy. And, and like, but I, but I have the platinum record on my wall. I mean, they, they, and I think if you look it up on Spotify or some of the, some of the streaming services now on credits, my name is there, but, but it's not listed on all music, speaking of which. But um, that was the last record I used that machine on. And then I had three MPC 3000s at once because those machines would, would get really hot. And like sometimes like the sensors under the pads would go or that dial thing. I, I always had one in the shop. There was one hardwired into my programming rig at home and then one that was portable to take to, to, to sessions around yeah. town. And then I, I kept one when I wasn't using it as much. And then I finally... I started out with a cat too, and um, I love the cat, but it was very unreliable on the road. I had a couple horrible mishaps in high profile situations. And after the third time, I sent a production manager out. Um, I was doing a tour with one of these artists that wasn't big in the States, but huge in the UK. That yeah. was the last, one of the last tours I did in like 
98, 99. And um, we were playing an arena over there. And, and, and it was like sound check. The cat lost all of the memory. And the whole show, I had a kick, I had a kick show mount trigger, a snare show mount trigger. Plus, with my left hand, I'm playing all these like little percussive sounds. And, um, and, um, and I was like, okay, this can't happen. I was like, go buy whatever the current Roland Octopad is. And I think it was an SPD-20. Yeah. So I switched to those, but yeah, a few years ago, I went through my storage locker and any electronic gear like that, I just, I sold on consignment um, in, at a shop in New York because I, I just like, I've been doing everything in the box. Like my so setup. Now you're just on Pro Tools. Yeah, just in Pro Tools. And I don't know if you can see behind me, but like, this is my little portable rig back here, which is Beautiful. a couple of speakers and, and a new MacBook Pro. And that's it. Like I have a MIDI keyboard controller that I occasionally plug in and I just use it when I need a pitch wheel. Cause I also program key parts, not just, um, now they call it programming beats back, back in the day, a beat was just the drums, but yeah. So I'll do full tracks for people, but, uh, I just, it's all in the box and my setup in, in New York, it's, it's a slightly bigger setup cause I have bigger monitors, but it's essentially, I'm just running with a desktop Mac and, um, totally portable, throw it in a backpack and off you go, man. Yeah. But the good thing about Pro Tools is even though a lot of people will start in like Cubase or um, Ableton or Logic, by the time most like uh, records, by the time it's being mixed, the audio is in Pro Tools. So sure. by the time somebody wants me to work on their record, and a lot of times I'll just kind of like my friend calls me a drum fixer. Like, like there's already programming and a lot of times it's great programming, but they just want me to tweak it and maybe add some live drums. And usually it's a, the lines are blurrier now with what's live and what's programmed. Cause I'll, I'll play some live shit where I'll literally just track eight bars and then we'll beat detect it. And then it's like, at that point is it really like a live drum part? But, um, but I'll do that. And I don't even bring my laptop with me. I'll just literally bring a thumb drive with, with my sample library because I know I can just sit down at the Pro Tools rig that the session is being run on. So nice. I, I like to travel very light these days. So I, I've got some samples floating around out there. I think that the that the package is sold like cardboard, um, huh. but it's uh, if you if, if for the listeners, it's Nashville sample. Nashville Sample Co. Look it up. The Rich Redmond drum package. I basically sampled every drum I own um, for like two 18-hour days at a world-class studio. And the sounds are really good, man. And But, uh, you know, I unless you're with a huge like slate or something like that, it's hard to let the world know that that stuff exists and how to find uh, well, it. Uh, um, I'm going to check it out. I, I'm constantly updating my library. And sometimes I'll buy a collection and I'll literally just find one snare and one kick. Or for electronic stuff, it, yeah. I'll spend 100 bucks just if there's one really useful electronic can clap that I don't have anything that sounds like it, it'll yeah. pay for itself. I mean, so. I'm so, I'm being super self-deprecating, but I mean, if if I mean, I think the package is 150 bucks. If you yeah. end up putting one of my drum samples on the next Miley hit, be like, Rich, your finger snap is on the... <laughs> Yeah. That'd be Did you do finger snaps? No, I didn't. But I'm just saying, uh, Wolf could yeah. take any sound. He could take my floor tom sound and turn it into a finger snap. I could. He so. could totally do it. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. Well, how do you go about, how did you go about getting the work as a programmer? Like, what was the turning point? What was that first opportunity where somebody cracked the door for you? And then obviously now you have kicked it open. It's, um, I'm trying to remember. It, actually, the first major label recording I did was with Hiram when he was still on Atlantic. And when I actually used my, I got an advance from him when I got the gig because I, I wanted to get more electronics than just that Yamaha RX machine. So um, I got my drum cat and some shell mount triggers and uh, my, my first sampler, which was a Casio because I couldn't afford the Akai S900 or whatever was the thing at the time. Yeah. And he had just gotten the first generation MPC 60. So he would let me use that. And um, so I, now they call it hybrid drumming, but my kit back then, 
um, was just a small kit with, with the electronics on one side. And um, so the, his record, he had already cut half of it with um, Will Lee and Charlie Drayton were the rhythm section. And then the second half was with the, an amazing player, the, the other Steve in the band, Steve Logan, who died a year before Iron. Um, so man, the older I get, like, it's probably the same for you guys. Like every year, amazing players. Are just, we're, lo we're losing people, man. Yeah. But um, anyway, so yeah, um, he, they finished the record and it was uh, Dave Delone. Well, I don't know if you know Dave, he's an LA guy now, but he, he was at Berkeley. We both got the gig with Hiram at the same time. He's part of the Ricky Minor camp. Okay. So American Idol, Tonight Show. Dave is the most modest guy. His resume is ridiculous. But <laughs> um, Dave was also into programming. And um, so Hiram let Dave and I program some stuff because Hiram was all, wanted to keep the record current sounding. So um, I programmed some stuff and I, I also bought, when I got a little more money, a Roland R8 drum machine. I don't know if you remember that one. Oh, that yeah. was like, I got that right before Hiram sold me his MPC-60. So yeah, I used the R8 on the record. I used his MPC-60 on the record. And then after that, I think it, it took a minute before people started having me program. But like here and there, people would hear, hear that I programmed and they'd use me on stuff. I think when I started to get a lot more programming work, because the session work I was getting in the 90s was like in between tours, and I started getting some like pretty decent credits as, a, as a, an acoustic drummer. And then in like 99, I was like, I just got to get off the road because I would miss these amazing calls. And I, and I realized the only way I'm going to work my way up and become a first call in New York is I have to be available. So yeah. I took that leap of faith. And, um, and you know that saying, burn the ships? I, yeah. I, I basically told everybody I'm not available for touring knowing I was probably going to be hurting for, for a minute, but I had some savings and, um, and I, I mean, but at the, would, would you willing to, um, while you're making that leap as a first call drummer, session drummer and programmer, yeah. could you go and do a wedding in New Jersey or do? Oh, some absolutely. Yeah. I still did some like local gigs, but I, I ultimately, and I also had, this is a whole other discussion, but I was having like back problems and problems with my hands. So I was tr like, just drumming was becoming a, like a physically painful thing. So I was trying to have a more balanced thing where I'm programming some and drumming some. And, um, and I also just saw that if I want to be working on popular music, it's going to be more and more programmed. So um, I, I was taking gigs here and there. And, and as I started making more money, just doing session work, I was able to like do it's, until it got to the point where I think I would go like a year in between gigs. And those gigs with Oz that you saw me at, those were some of the first gigs I had done in maybe like a year or two. Wow. And yeah, because I, I generally just, it's not that I won't do it. It's more that like I won't, I won't be my own tech anymore. I just, I can't be lugging my kit. And that's mostly because of back issues. So I'll tell people if they call me for a local gig and I'm like, if I don't have to bring any drums. And if it's music I really like, I'm like, don't pay me. But if, if what we're going to pay me will cover cartage or or a tech, I'll do it. But a lot of times they'll say, well, it's a house kit. All you have to bring is your snare, your hardware, and your cymbals. And I'm like, that's practically the whole... Back in the day, I called it my taxi kit. It was an 18-inch kick, 13-inch snare, small hats, crash ride, and a tam yeah. like a tambourine. That was my whole kit. I didn't bring Tom's to local gigs. So at least if I was taking myself. I mean, so. that's kind of the reality of the gigging New York drummer. Cause I was going to ask you, what is that reality say for a kid that's graduating from Berkeley, UNT, Miami musicians Institute. Now, They're like, all right, I'm going to the city that never sleeps and I'm going to schlep my stuff around in, in Ubers and subways. Yeah. It's like a nightmare. Yeah. It, it, it was hard. I, I had to like have these strategies because pre Uber with taxis, if they saw drums, they wouldn't stop. So I was, I would, <laughs> So I how do you do it? What's, what's the, what's the they trick? They don't stop if they see people. <laughs> so, and like, I got it to the point where I could carry my whole kit at once. So, um, like, cause I had like a, a, a bag for my kick that was over my shoulder or symbols or the other thing snare in one hand and the hardware bag in the other hand. Nice. And I just like walk up, up, up and down the street like that. So what I would do is I got to know all the, like the downtown clubs. It was a mostly downtown I would find places, it was a mailbox, whatever, where I could kind of stack most of my shit behind it. And I would just stand there with my cymbal bag and sticks and hail a cab. And as soon as they'd stop, I'd say, hey, can you pop your trunk? They'd pop the trunk, I'd leave it open, and then I'd grab the rest of my shit, throw it in there. And they would oh, always- Oh, but they could have driven away, right? But- That happened once. 
And I, I actually mm. chased it. It's only because there's traffic, like lights and traffic is so slow in New York that I was able to catch up with the guy. But he, I had just gotten my kick in and he took off. So and was he trying way. to rip, he was trying to steal the kit? Well, well that's the thing. He, when I, I like caught up at the next red light and I get in the car and I'm like, what the fuck? And he was like, what? I thought you were in the cab. And I was like, bullshit. You knew I wasn't in the cab. You were just trying like, you, you saw some gear and you were driving away. So Damn. But, Let me um, ask you, what, what time yeah. period were you in New York? Um, 90 like, to present, right? Yeah, 90 to present. Yeah, I mean, now I'm mostly in LA or at least right. back and forth. But yeah, um, I started working in New York in 89, but I moved there full time in 90. And so okay. like, this is like 90 to like 2000 was when I was, if I wasn't on tour, I was gigging a lot in clubs. Were you keeping up with any other bands in around the area and stuff like that during the 90s? Yeah, I mean, and I, and I also like, I, I was in a few bands and I worked with a lot of singer songwriters and occasionally I'd fill in for a drummer in another band. So did you play in a band there or? I played in and around the area mid to late nineties with a couple of original bands and some that were covers, mostly in Westchester. If you ever got up that Yeah, way. Jim and I are both from Connecticut. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I did some sessions in Westchester for like, a some songwriters that, that bought houses up there, but I yeah. wasn't that. Theme. That's right. You're from Connecticut, Rich. It's crazy. You, uh, you ever it's hear crazy. Band, you ever hear of or remember the band called Jam Syndicate? Does that ring a bell? That sounds familiar. Yeah. But that also sounds like a cool band name. So, um, <laughs> so um, probably where where did, when when you played in the city, what types of venues were you playing? Do you remember the names of any of the clubs? Well, I played like around. Uh, I mean, in that area, Westchester County, Dutchess, Fairfield County, in Connecticut. Not really much in the city, but they did. Jam okay. Syndicate did. Uh, another band called Liquid Circus was another one. They were kind of like a ahead of their time rock. Like when when they started incorporating DJs into the rock yeah. rap thing. Yeah. They were kind of on the leading edge of that. But you know. Uh, hey, is that busy. Club Brownie still there in New York? Oh man, that's going way. I haven't heard that name in forever. I don't think they are. I, I remember that club. That was the lower that, that was the Lower East Side or East Village venue, I believe. Um, man, there were so many clubs that are gone now. I mean, I not know. even now, last. New York has become more and more corporate, and a lot of the, the great, like it's really sad. The bitter end might go under. Which oh, is, they, yeah. They, they achieved historic landmark status, which is why they didn't get shut down. Even like CBGBs, which should have achieved historic landmark status, didn't. Now it's like a, a John Vado, John Varvado store yeah. that I shop at. Hello, yeah. which is a trip. And then, um, and I haven't been in, but I've heard they've that he's kept certain things intact from the. He has, club. yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, the bitter end. I mean, what what a, a legendary club. And um, yeah, I think basically since this whole thing started, um, they just their rent is astounding. You know, commercial, commercial rent in the village is just astronomical. So I think they still have to pay their rent every month. And, and, and I think they're, they're, they're trying to like pay their staff as much as possible. So, um, just to keep people afloat. Yeah. I but, mean, but see, but back to that whole thing of the drummer with the dream and, and it's ever yeah. like, okay, kid, you're gonna have to move to New York or LA. And occasionally if somebody's like, Oh, I could, I could, play that backbeat Nashville stuff. Maybe I'll go there. Yeah. Um, what does a kid kind of do? Does he have to get four roommates in Queens? Yeah. And then, I, I, I mean, I had roommates when I first moved there and, and back then you could still kind of afford to live in the city. Now I think I've heard from my friends that are in town now in New York, they said that rents are dropping because so many people are leaving the city, but wow. um, I'm lucky. My, my place is rent stabilized and it's by Union Square. Great location. I've been there for 20 some years. And, um, same is, spot, 20 years. Uh, I think 25 years at this point. Yeah. So your, does your, your land, landlord comes by and you're like, Hey, the, you got to fix this over here. And he's like, no problem. <laughs> it's uh, definitely not that vibe. It's, it's a <laughs> big building, but like I kind of, I stay out of the landlord's hair. They stay out of mine. And, um, um, New York isn't exactly the friendliest place. <laughs> no. And like, I, I don't know how many, there's always going to be some clubs for young drummers to play in, but it's definitely not like it was. Cause there are a lot of clubs that, that I used to work at that I watched as they stopped booking live acts and DJ culture took over. So, yeah. um, there's, there'll always be some places, but, um, yeah, I don't know if New York's going to be the spot anymore. Cause like I have more New York musician friends that live out here in LA now and in Nashville than, that are still in the city. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe New York had its time, but oh, but I wanted to go back to something you were saying about when I got programming work. When I first, <laughs> like, when I took that leap of faith and said I'm just going to do sessions, I was getting some drum calls and some good ones. But um, um, 
people didn't want to hire me just to program drums. They're like, if I'm hiring a programmer, I'm hiring somebody to do the whole track. And so I invested in, I had like, I had just racks with like every synth module. I want to stay current. And I got into doing, that's how I got into remixing because I was doing full tracks for people. And, um, and people would hire me then to do that. And then I think eventually people started, it got to the point where people were hiring me to program and it didn't even know I played drums. And then somehow enough people knew that I, that I was a drummer. And then they started thinking of me as the guy that like, well, you can do both. You can program drums and do acoustic drums. And, and that's when I was able to um, just, I guess, rebrand myself as a drummer programmer. And yeah. then it wasn't, I had to do, and I'll still, there's certain producers I'll do like all the, the instrumental shit, the non-percussive programming. But uh Mo what I really like doing best is, and I feel it's my, my, my biggest strength is just doing the rhythmic programming. Nice. So, so. Yeah. Did, you, that's did you guys ever use the Roland TR-505? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I think I have some TR-505. I have one sample uh, mini library that's like every drum machine somebody had, like built a, the sample list of everything. So I'm pretty sure I have some 505 samples. That was te technically my first drum machine. Oh, that's technically. cool. And I, I like I like how you said you know Pro Tools. Everybody ends up on Pro Tools. Yeah, there's a million DAWs and a million platforms, but yeah. if you're gonna do all the craziness and the the learning curve that goes into learning a DAW, you might as well learn the most popular one on the planet. Yeah. Like I did. Yeah. Yeah. So For yeah. Sure. I'll and working yeah. with producers, like um, if you're looking at the biggest producers on the planet, Dr. Luke, Mark Ronson, uh, Max Martin, Babyface. I mean, that had, those had to be incredible experiences. Were you in the room with those guys? Yeah. So, so Luke is one of my oldest friends. So, um, relationships and, and, in action. What's that? Relationships. A hundred percent. And then Luke, when when he first blew up. When I met Luke, he was a, like he wanted to be the next George Benson. He was like a blazing young jazz guitar player. And then he played in the oh. SNL band and then he kind of shifted and he, he got into the electronic thing. He was DJing and he got signed briefly as an electronic artist and then major label, but it, it, it fell through. And I guess he became a tax write off to the label, but he used that money to buy his first Pro Tools rig. And that's when back then to get into Pro Tools, it was before they had like the, now that you have like HD, like regular and Pro Tools Lite, back then it was just what would be considered HD. So you needed tens of thousands to get into like a, a really high-end Pro Tools rig. So he, he got a really nice setup. And then that's when he started um, becoming more focused on writing, producing pop and R&B music and hip hop music. And um, so I was just there throughout that. So um, I was part of his inner circle when he blew up and his first big hit, was uh, Kelly Clarkson since you've been gone, which I didn't play on, but that was with uh, Max Martin, and I think Max's drummer played on. It was somebody in, in Stockholm who played on that one, and um, so I did a bunch of sessions with Luke. The first time I met Max, they flew me to Stockholm to work in Max's studio, and so for a few years I was doing a lot of stuff where Luke and Max were both there all the time, and then they'd be writing at Luke's place in Manhattan, where they they had like a Luke had a duplex, so I'd be downstairs they would play me a bunch of song ideas and just give me the MPC and say, program some stuff on all these. And they'd, they'd be upstairs working with top line writers. And that's how I met Katy Perry the first time. But she was like, I don't even know if she was signed yet, or maybe she was newly signed, but I didn't, even, I didn't know who she was. She was just another random like singer songwriter chick. Yeah. So, so I was around a lot of cool shit like that. And then Mark Ronson, I've only done two, two recordings with him. And it was only because um, his main guy, and I forget his name, but he's the main Dap King drummer. He had like, hurt, I think he hurt his leg or his arm. Or he had some kind of nerve damage. So, um, and that's the whole word of mouth thing. Just like enough people in, in Mark's camp knew me and said, call this guy. And so he was there and that was a great experience. And um, who else? Oh, Babyface. That was horrible session, but he was great. No, no, he was great. It was a horrible session and that it was a session that, that like should not have had drums on it. It was Aretha Franklin. And, um, I, I have a good relationship with, um, and Mincielli who's Alicia Keys, longtime engineer, and they have a studio at jungle city in, this, in Manhattan. And, um, I get a lot of calls from them because most of the stuff they do, it's, it's a lot of like modern pop and R and B and hip hop where they're not cutting a lot of live instruments. So, yeah. 
when, when for Alicia, they'll call me to come in and, and do, sometimes I'll program it for her, but usually it's, it's drum kit stuff. But there will be other people through there. Like I worked with Beyonce through Stuart White, who was one of the Jungle City engineers, who's Beyonce is now a longtime engineer. And, um, but yeah, Anne would just randomly call me. She'd be like, hey, are you in New York? And I'm like, yeah. And she'll be like, can you come in today? And I'll just go in because I know if whoever it is, it's going to be a cool session. So I get there and I'm like, what's the session? She's like, oh, it's Aretha. And I was... You know, I'm a an Shaka and Aretha are my two favorite. Yeah, you know, and you so. worked with Shaka. There you go. I did, yeah, so I got to work with both of my favorites. So, um, but yeah, so Aretha wasn't there. She'd already tracked her vocals in Detroit, and I think she hates flying. And um, it was a record that uh, it was all covers. I think it's called Aretha Franklin sings the great diva classics, and Clive Davis was in charge, and Babyface was producing a bunch of it, and it was a that Barbara Streisand song, People. And they mm -hmm. cut it with orchestra with huge, like, um, massive tempo shifts and a lot of, like, holds and no click. They did it live with the conductor. And then um, Clive was like, I hear drums on this, on this track. So I met Babyface and his engineer, who, and the engineer really had his work cut out for him. Great engineer. And I'm, I don't want to say his name because I might get it wrong. So sorry. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> totally. mm -hmm. But um, I think it's Paul, but anyway, so it was one of those things where first they, I got, I went there and got sound in the afternoon and they're like, we're going to do some backgrounds with Aretha, with Aretha's background singers on another track. We'll call you in an hour. Then now all of a sudden it's like approaching midnight. I finally get there. They're ready for me. And, um, baby face is like, I'm going to go have dinner. I'll be back. You work with the engineer at midnight. He was having dinner. It was like, it was probably maybe like a little uh, normal. I've been since New York, you know? So, um, so I'm working and what the engineer had done is he had like manually like drawn in a click for the song. But like I said, there, there's, there's certain stops and there's a pause and, and it's only the conductor cue the orchestra in. And there's certain things where like the tempo would literally pick up like 20 BPM in a bar because it's, it's like going from a slow session to a faster session. So he manually made a click for all that. But, and I didn't know this until after I was like run ragged that the click wasn't really spot on with the stuff. So, oh, no. so I'm doing like, first I transcribed the song just so I'd have a roadmap for myself. Sure. And we, I've seen you talk about this. We all have our own shorthand. So sure. I made my, and, um, and I'm playing, and after each take, he's like, yeah, man, your, your time, you're not really, it's just not locked. And I'm, I started to think I was going crazy. And after like, and it's a long song, and there are a lot of takes. I was like, can I come in there? Because I, I started doubting myself. I was like, I know I have a good time. I've been doing this for years. Right. Um, and I come in and, and he said, just, yeah, check it out. It's just not locking up. And I said, let me ask you a question. Because I, I always keep the click cranked in my, sure. in my, and, um, and I said, were you listening with the click? He said, no, I'm just hearing you in the song. And I said, I am locked with the click. Do me a favor, turn the click on and just listen to me in the click without the track. And he's like, oh shit, I'm really sorry, man. And he's like, I don't have time to like, to fix the click because it's too many movements. He said, let's just, and at that point, Babyface got back in. He, he heard what was going on and he said, how about this? Um, and you can see I was really worn out at this point. And um, you, you, you know, you, your, your whole nervous system after enough takes just, and, um, and it's a Aretha record and I want to do a great job. So he's like, you're like, I really, and Babyface, who doesn't have to apologize to me, very, a lot of humility is like, I'm really sorry to put you through this and you're being really patient. Just give me three takes, like three or four takes. And now with no click, you kind of know the song by now, get as close as you can and we'll comp it at the end. So that's what happened. Wow. Yeah. Well, so, good job, man. We got to roll was, with the, you got to roll with the punches, don't we? Yeah. It's like. But that, that was one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult session I've ever done. But, but yeah, but it was great to work with Babyface. So. Oh, I'm sure, man. Well, you know, Jim, it, I know you probably watch a little late night TV, you know, the Seth Meyers yeah. kind of thing where he's had every, every great drummer in the world sit in for, I, I think it's a week at a time, five days or so yeah. with the HE band. Yeah. And um, you did that. Tell us about that experience. I, um, that was cool because like I said, I don't really play live much anymore. It's great for me because it's local and um, I've worked, I've done SNL a few times, so I know the layout, the lay of the land there. But uh, do you know Eric? Have you done the show? I, I've met Eric Lederman because we, um, I judged the Guitar Center drum okay. off in LA about three or four years ago and he was there. So we met yeah. briefly and we have a million mutual friends. I'd love to yeah. do it. 
Um, I will happily put in a good word. Last time I tried to recommend somebody, he was like very politely like, he's like, I have a long list. The list is so long. <laughs> yeah. He's like basically he, he knows everybody. So he's yeah. like, you don't have to tell me who so-and-so is. Of course, I'm going to call him at some point. So, right. um, so in the, so yeah, uh, we had some mutual friends and he just tipped me up one day. He just DM me on Instagram and was like, Hey man, we'd love to have you do the show. Like, and he said, I have these two weeks available, which one works. And, um, so I, I just jumped on it and um, it was, they make it really easy for you because um, the MD, they basically, every day you go, they have a writing room with a V drum kit and some low volume Zildjian's and, um, and they're like, here are the walk-ons we have tonight. Well, the, 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 um, the theme, you can't learn the, the theme, right? You got the theme, theme and outro are the same. You just rehearse it. But then each night they do original music for the cues and the walk-ons and the walk-offs. And, and, um, so he'll be like, Hey, we need something that's kind of like happy for this guest. And for this, we need something a little somber. And so, and the cool thing is they give you a, they, they give you writing credit for, for all that. So wow. you, you, you all, and it's not a lot, but you still get some mailbox money from that while you're there. And what you do is we come up with it on the spot and then record it in that room. And then by the time the show starts in our in-ears, as they're going towards commercial, we all have our own little mics and the MD will say, okay, th remember this one, we're about to do this. And he'll play eight bars of that thing it's that we that day. So question, it's there question, and I'll just, and, and as soon as there's the cue, Eric or somebody will say now, and then I count it off and we play it. And so I didn't have to make charts for any of that. It was really, really straightforward. So. Well, it looks, it, look, it looks incredibly fun. And for the viewers, listeners out there, if you go to wolfadelic.com, I mean, cool this video. is just an amazing list. It's a really beautiful looking website. And maybe, the, maybe uh, I don't know if you're interested in this, but we've had like, I've had Paul Lyme on the show and Lonnie Wilson, and these guys have Spotify playlists of yeah. their huge hits that they've played on. So I, I mean, Wolf Radio, man, is a playlist. That's the next thing. Oh, thank you. I will, I will, I'm really bad with, with self-promotion. I'm trying, I'm trying to, to get a little better, but that's, that's all the discussion we can talk about third, the years of therapy. <laughs> well, I, I wish I was worse at it. I tell you that much. Um, but we, we do share some, a lot of common companies, your, your pro marks and your roll yep. and all that, those just wonderful people. Um, yeah. And uh, this is a fun part of the show. We call it the random question of the day. And we even have a jingle that goes like this. Are you ready, Wolf? I am, Jim. Okay. <laughs> Drum roll. Here we go. I've randomly, air quotes, pulled this up. Okay. <clears throat> Does absolute power corrupt? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think not necessarily. Because I know with most people it does, but I, I think most people are not their best selves. I think with a fully enlightened person, it does not necessarily corrupt. That I think is probably the most deep answer we've ever gotten. For that Definitely question. one of the most poignant <laughs> philosophical answers and quick. A lot of people usually look at the random question. They're like, geez, oh, mm, <laughs> why did I come on this podcast again? <laughs> no, that's the thing. It's like, I, I'm like, per, like I shed personal growth the way I used to shed like fusion shit. So, and, um, Rich, I know you 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 are a motivational speaker, so we've probably read a lot of the same books. And yeah, what are you what are you consuming right now? Yeah, um, right now it's actually I'm finishing an audio book called Sapiens, which is oh. which is just a, basically a history of, of humanity. And um, but what was the last book? I, one of the last books I read is called The Body Keeps the Score. It's about trauma and how to, how it manifests itself. It's, so it's neuroscience of, of PTSD and ways ways to. Uh, to um, heal from trauma. It's a, it's a really uncomfortable read, but a great book. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're all carrying around things. I mean, yeah. when, and once you get to the five Oh, you know, I just had the five Oh and went out to Joshua tree and played my Dharma drum and looked at the sunset yeah. and the stars and it was great. But yeah, you, you're dra you drag things around with you that will manifest the things that trigger. And like, I'm becoming more and more aware of this stuff. Oh, yeah, hundred percent. This and that. It's so much. Um, I posted on Instagram. My girl, 
surprised me on my birthday and hung up a favorite quote of mine by Young, which is, I might get it wrong, but it's until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life, but you'll call it fate. So, wow. because we all have so much, like, um, all these, like, subconscious narratives that we carry around and, and like, like, just, like, all these self-limiting subconscious, like, uh, anchors, you know, that, so, but, uh, but, yeah, that's all other discussion, but that, that, that's why I answered the way I answered, so. <laughs> that's a, <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, so, you got any uh, parting wisdom for somebody that wants to come into the music business at this point in human history? Or um, yeah, I would say it's, I think, no matter what, and, you know, you and I are both, we're all three of us are kind of old enough to, to have witnessed the, just the compl multiple paradigm shifts in, in the recording industry, even in the concert industry somewhat, and on the drum industry. And um, I think there's definitely not as much work as there used to be, like like the New York session scene. I grew up reading Modern Drummer about it, and... You know, back then, if you were an A-list, like, Gad, you could make seven figures a year. And then, like, the B and C players can make six figures a year. There was just so much work that is not there anymore. It's just so much is done on the computer by one person these days. And um, and so, but I, I still think if you're great at what you do, and you, I'm sure you get asked this advice all the time. It's like, how do I make it? And it's like, well, be good at what you do. <laughs> Don't be an asshole. And, and just keep doing it. Persevere. So, I mean, that is very good, like... Be great at what you do, don't be an asshole, and never stop. Yeah, and that's the thing. I've pivoted. Like, I start, I've gone in so many different directions in my career. It's only really, I'd say, in, like, the last 10 years that I kind of had this, like, essentialist view where it's, like, just what is my highest point of contribution? And let me be really clear about that because I used to introduce myself as drummer, programmer, writer, and I've, I've written a charting song or co-written, whatever. I've produced on some platinum records. I've done a lot of things, but it's like, I don't do that shit best. Like at what I do as a drummer slash programmer, that I'm world-class at. The other stuff I'm good at, I'm solid, but there are people that do all those things better than me. So let me just focus on what I do. So that's another thing I tell people, just figure out what, like, what you do, what's your highest point of contribution. And you, and you have to love it. Like I have a brother who makes way more money, both my brothers make way more money than I do. And they're both talented musically, but they do it as a hobby. And as a result, like when they play music, they really enjoy it because they, wow. they, they, they just do it for the love of it. Not what, do they, what do they do? Um, they both work for the evil empire. They both work at, uh, in the defense industry, the con the, like defense contracting industry in DC. And I, they both have like top secret security clearance. I don't, they can't even tell me exactly what they do, but right. something, something that my tax, all of our tax dollars is going to, and, uh, that my I brother, probably don't support. But my brother is an attorney. Okay. And, uh, you know, he's also a musician and was much more musical than I was growing up until I got into the drums and. Yeah. He plays on the weekends. He plays in a Journey tribute band and a Bob Seger tribute band, among other things. And that's certainly his outlet. You know, yeah, he, he needs it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And yeah. but he probably really loves it when he does it. And not that my goal is to only do gigs I love at this point. Mm -hmm. Like that to me is is like truly being successful. Sure. So because I'm sure we've all done gigs that we don't love doing, but. It's, you know, for different reasons, we got to say yes to certain things. But uh, so, yeah, it would be nice to only make music when I just really want to do it for the love of it. So nice. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, yeah, you've inspired me today, man. You've inspired me to, uh, man, to keep reading, to get deep, to uh, get my uh, programming rig together yeah. and to, um, to, to stay the course, man, and maybe not eat so much sugar, you know. Um, mm. But we're definitely overdue for like uh, an in-person visit. At least we'll be on the yeah. right the left side of the country together i'll be out there yeah. in october so maybe we can go to king's yeah. Road cafe and sit six feet apart and have a nice coffee yeah that sounds good to me be amazing no man uh, <laughs> yeah no sugar um, no sure. and what was i gonna say um something oh what is the instagram handle how do you how do you like to be found oh it's um at wolf i believe it's wolf underscore drums or maybe it's just wolf drums but i, I think and i need to get better with instagram my, my girlfriend works in social media so she's always like uh, gently kicking my ass to take it a little more seriously. Well, no, but but you know what's so funny is that you're so supportive. Like every time I do something, you're on there, man. You're oh, like, yeah. you're well, on no, there. I, 
I, I love supporting my friends, you know, like I'm, I'm, I love, like you said, we all celebrate each other's success. So for sure. It's actually Wolf underscore drums. So get in there and do the follow because you'll be able to follow uh, Wolf along with his journeys and all the records he's played on and everything and check out uh, wolfadelic.com. Jim, wasn't this fun? It was. Really great. It was. Man. We fun appreciate your time, man. Thanks, guys. No, thank you, guys. This is fun, and thanks for the plug. Appreciate it. And uh, let's let's talk uh, off camera at some point soon. Yeah, we're yeah, absolutely. We'll, well, this we're, we're going to just end this up right now by thanking everyone, thanking the School of Rock, thanking all of our listeners and viewers. If you love this show, subscribe, share, rate, and review. Give us a five star rating. It takes thirty seconds. If you love us, you hate us, you just want to send us an email. I got an email address for you: the Rich Redmond Show at gmail dot com. And keep coming back for the good stuff. We appreciate it. We love. You. We'll see you next time. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.